So we carry on with our explanation for chapter two, and we will be talking about, uh, it, which is about rolling stock uh, systems. And we have reached a, a rolling stock body shell and its crash worthiness. So we have reached section two. And in this section, we'll talk about different materials that could, uh, could, uh, make a, a, a body shell and what are their uh, components. So uh, what are their uh, characteristics? So without further ado, let's start. And this is the, this is the beginning of the slides and let's start. So in this section, we'll talk about the body shell and material requirements and we'll be doing a comparison between different materials. Then we'll be talking about some of the manufacturing techniques, the crash worthiness and crash worthiness is a very important concept that is taking a great uh, influence recently and some of the crash worthiness strategy. And if you don't know what's crash worthiness, you need to be remembering that car that is uh, being crashed with a wall and they, they, then they have that dummy inside the inside the driving seat, which end up to be safe. So it's a, it's it's being it's ending up safe after a major accident. So an ideal body shell material would be light in weight, so it does not damage the infrastructure, and it has a, a good aerodynamics, and it does not it it is easy to be propelled. Also, it should be very strong. And it should have fatigue resistance, which is a cyclic loading for a long time. And also not affected by corrosion and weather conditions in a very ideal situation, not uh, inexpensive and easily fabricated and repaired. These are like the ideal requirements that we expect to achieve within uh, our uh, body shell or our uh, vehicle body shell. And most common used materials today are uh, steel, stainless steel, and aluminum. So let's look at comparison of materials used in real vehicles, but the shells, of course. So there is the steel, there is the authentic stainless steel, there is the aluminum alloy, and there is the uh, uh, glass fiber reinforced polymer. So we look at density, and with density that's 785, 850, kilogram per meter cube. This is a standard uh, steel density. And for authentic steel, you have it around 8,000, a little bit higher. The aluminum alloy, alloy is much lighter in weight. It's 2,750. And the glass fiber reinforced polymer is 2,100. So this is, you, you can guess the weight based on the density. The tensile strength, uh, a sign of uh, strength, the steel is 500, the stainless steel is 700, the aluminum alloy is not that strong, but it's light, it's 150, and the uh, glass fiber reinforced polymer is 1,020, but we don't choose the material only based on lightweight and, uh, and strength, we consider the cost and we consider also the ease of fabrication. So specific strength, uh, this is related to, uh, to the strength as well. Modulus of elasticity, how, how the elasticity happened within this material. In steel is 210, authentic steel is 193, 69 for aluminum alloy and 45 for glass fiber reinforced polymer. And specific stiffness, those are some of the characteristics that you'll be looking at any material that will make your body shell. The technique, there are different techniques and those techniques will be looking at uh, the, like lamination with prepex, uh, filament welding, vacuum uh, wrist, uh, wrist and transfer uh, uh, molding, bultrusion is very famous one where you have these, you, you get these uh, cross section and hand layup where you, you just, uh, put the uh, body shell components together and you connect them with hands. So the process speed, you'll be looking at process speed or looking at process difficulty, geometric limitation, mode or die cost, the mode cost, manufacturing costs and surface finish. So for the lamination with bricks, the process speed is slow, the process difficulty is high, the geometric limitation, there is no geometric limitation, you can get any shape but the mold cost is high and the manufacturing cost is high, but the surface finish is excellent. 
The filament whittling is a fast process that to, to, to be done is difficult. The difficulty is high. You end up with a cylindrical, a cylindrical geometric shape and uh, uh, the mod cost is uh, the mod cost is high. The manufacturing co the, the mold cost is high. The manufacturing cost is low for volume. But surface finish is moderate to good. The vacuum molding is the process speed is medium. The process difficulty is low. There is a certain geometric limitation. The undercuts are difficult. The mold cost is high. The manufacturing cost is low. The surface finish is excellent. Boltrogen is a very fast process. The process difficulty is low, the constant, but you end up with constant cross section. <laughs> you just uh, keep um, uh, doing the same cross section again and again. The mode cost is medium, the manufacturing cost is medium, and the surface finish is good. And for hand layup, it's the process is, is medium slow, the process difficulty is very slow. And the geometric limitation, it can be rather difficult. The mode cost is low and the manufacturing cost is low. And the surface finish, it depends on the mold or on the mold. So we, we end up with crash worthiness. We'll be talking about how train can derail or collide. And if they have a crash, if you have a crash worthy vehicle, it would save many, many lives. So this is a crash in a, in a vehicle, and you can see the, uh, the impact of that crash. And usually, there are different strategies for uh, designing our vehicle for, uh, to be crash worthy. So the traditional approach was to build very, very strong vehicles. And you would expect that the first uh, few vehicles that will hit the ground or the first few vehicles that will hit the other vehicles will be the most damaged. But the new, the new approach is collagen energy management where you have those crumble zones. And crumble zones, those zones that would fail and would crumble while the others would not. Those areas would fail while the others would not because the energy would be transferred from one crumble zone to another crumble zone. So they are designed at the ends of the vehicle and collagen energy is spread out along the train. So you end up with a train with uh, that the crumble zones have crumbled, but the, the, the whole body is intact and you can replace them. Uh, of course, not as simple as that. And you would end up saving many, many lives and with lower costs. You don't have to change the whole vehicle. So that was chapter two. We'll be talking about railway vehicle dynamics in section three. And uh, without further ado, We'll see you on the next lesson. Have a great evening. Take care.